Uh, if you brought your Bibles, let's take them out and we will turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 4. I have been excited about this section of Revelation. We just finished up chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation are, a, are a, a section on their own, the seven letters to the seven churches in the Roman province of Asia Minor. You know, it's important as we go through Revelation to remember that this letter was not written to us. It was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. However, it has been preserved for us so that we can learn, so that we can study it, so that we can see what uh, the first Christian church went through and the type of advice and admonishments that God gave them. So the letter was written to the churches in the province of Asia Minor, but it was preserved for our learning. Uh, the next section then, after those seven letters, is chapters four and five. We're going to treat four and five as a group. And I've been excited about four and five because it's all about the praise and adoration and exaltation of God on his throne. John sees this and imagine John seeing this vision from the Isle of Patmos where he's probably gone through the Roman courts. He's been stripped of his possessions. He's been exiled to hard labor in the Isle of Patmos. And they say that you spent your evenings chained to something. So here is this miserable situation that John is in. And the heavens open up and he gets this beautiful vision of God on the throne. That is the primary purpose of chapters 4 and 5. God on the throne, Christ seated next to him. But there's actually two things that I want to cover as we look at chapters 4 and 5. Uh, the, the primary one is going to be the exaltation of God on the throne. And then there are several songs. There are five songs that get sung in chapters 4 and 5. These five songs are going to tell us a lot about the one that sits on the throne. So that's the primary focus, the one on the throne, and what is the nature of the songs that are being sung to God? Okay, that's primary. But there's also a secondary aspect of chapters 4 and 5 that I call the cultic images. When I say cultic images, I'm talking about all the things that stick out about Revelation, the descriptive things like the beast and the 24 elders and the rainbow around his head, the four creatures, all of those uh, cult images type things. Now, all of those images are of secondary importance. We would get everything we need out of Revelations 4 and 5 if we just looked at God on the throne and the five songs that were sung about him. But so what we're going to do is we're going to break uh, chapter 4 into two sections. Today, I want to talk just briefly about eight of the cultic symbols that are in chapter 4. And then next week, I want to redo chapter 4, but focus on who's on the throne and the songs that are being sung to him. Uh, to get us ready for how this stuff lays out, Ben Witherington is a, a brilliant scholar on Revelations. And he kind of gives us the idea of what to expect, the language. This is very flowery, grandiose, awesome language describing God. And Ben says that it is called the rhetoric of display. So the rhetoric of display, uh, Ben Witherington, commonly called the rhetoric of display, it's the proper function is to amplify or, or embellish the main theme or the subject matter. Got you. It focuses on lavish praise or lavish blame. This particular throne room scene comports with this approach in the lavish descriptions and the effusive praise of God. So we kind of have to understand this language, this genre, is this flowery, very grandiose language because that's what was used in that first century. It was a Jewish tradition to speak of their king in this very grandiose, lavish way. It was also the Roman imperial tradition that when the emperor sat on the throne that he was talked about in a very grandiose way. Uh, a couple examples for us. Nero, boy, if you guys have a copy of Tacitus's uh, The Histories of Rome by Tacitus, it's called The Annals. Uh, chapter 14 of Tacitus's History of Rome, he writes some fascinating information about Nero. Nero apparently was just getting a little bored uh, with being the emperor of Rome, 
and he all of a sudden wanted to race chariots, he wanted to sing in the Greek theaters, and he wanted to play a lyre in public. So he wanted to be a musician, he wanted to be a, a bohemian, I guess. Man uh, wanted to get out and do a bunch of stuff. Well, basically he didn't have any talent, and so when Nero would go out and perform at night, he would absolutely humiliate himself what was interesting is the Senate thought that the crowd would lose respect for him being uh, humiliating himself in public, but the worse he was, the more the crowd loved him. It's very strange. So uh, here's uh, what uh, Tacitus records. Uh, Day and night they shouted their applause using epithets reserved for the gods. This is this flowery, grandiose language. Uh, to describe the emperor's appearance and to describe his voice. All right, so they were pretty uh, excited about him. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 21, we've got a, a small example of this grandiosity. Uh, when Herod sat on the throne and he addressed all the people, it says in Acts chapter 12 and verse 21, 12 and 21, on the appointed day, Herod donned his royal robes and he sat on his throne and he addressed the people and they all began to shout, wow, this is the voice of a God. This is not even a man. Okay, so you get the picture of what these acclamations were like in the first century church. Later on in Revelation, we're going to see other acclamations that are extending from the throne of the Roman kings to now using a, a more apocalyptic language, the throne of the dragon himself. Revelations 13, 4 through 6, they worshiped the dragon because he had been given authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast and they said, who is like the beast and who could possibly fight against him? So that's the kind of language that was being used and that's the kind of language we're going to see in chapters 4 and 5. We're going to find out that there is a competition for who is really on the throne. Who is really on the throne? One commentator said, to whom does the earth really belong? Who is really the ruler of the world? The book's central theological symbol, therefore, is going to be the throne. We saw uh, in some of the letters to the churches, it says that I know where you live, where the, where the throne of Satan exists, right? So we have the throne of Satan in some places. This throne of Satan was uh, the imperial temples of worshiping Rome and worshiping the king. We're going to see how people were forced to bow down to whatever Caesar lived at that time. So there are these thrones that are competing. The synagogue of Satan, which he said were the Jews that were persecuting the church. There's all these people that appear to be in power on earth. And so at this time when John and the church might be losing hope, they're given this vision of who is really on the throne, who is really in power. Powerful, all-inspiring language is used to elaborate the character of God's throne, to amplify his majesty, and what we're seeing here is a typical Roman scene where the emperor is enthroned by his council, surrounded by his council, and holding in his hand an open scroll. Except for the throne scene that we're about to see is one that we have to have the heavens open up in order to be able to see it. So let me read our text for today. We're going to do chapter 4. And then we'll uh, exposit just a little bit. Revelations chapter 4. And after this, uh, behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. If you like to write in your Bibles, I would put a big old circle around verse 2 there. That's the whole theme of chapter 4. Verse 2. I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne stood in heaven, and there was one who was seated on the throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian, 
and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the 24 thrones were 24 elders. They were clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And behold, the throne there, and behold, before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass that was like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in the front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. The four living creatures, each of them had six wings, full of eyes all around and within. Day and night they never ceased, and here is the first song of praise. Again, these songs of praise are the other primary aspect of this vision. So the first song of praise is, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and forever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord. Here's the second song. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and they are created. So I just want to hit briefly, since this is secondary, but didn't you at least get curious? What are the 24 elders? What are the four creatures? What are the cherubims? What are the lion, the ox, the, the eagle, and the human? What is all that stuff? It's not primary. Okay, we could get the whole idea of worshiping the one on the throne, even if we didn't define those things. But just because inquiring minds want to know, we're going to touch on each of them. So there were eight, the open door in heaven, the throne room vision, the precious stones, the 24 elders, progressive theophanies, that means the songs that were sung, the four cherubim, the casting crowns. What are casting crowns? Do you know what that means? We're going to deal with what it means to cast their crowns. And then finally... Uh, the Greek chorus, the Greek chorus, the aspect of these songs of praise. So I'm just going to touch each one of them quickly. Uh, number one, we're going to deal with the open door. Verse one, uh, after this, I looked, behold, a door was standing open in heaven. Then the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. This idea of what I'm going to call an apocalyptic. Oh, what would I call it? an apocalyptic view into heaven, right? An apocalyptic ascent into heaven. This is very common language throughout the Old Testament, very common language when a, when a, a, a prophet was going to see a vision. And let me just talk about a few of them here. We can get a feel for this. In Psalms 78 and 23, the psalmist said that uh, God commanded the skies above and he opened the doors of heaven and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. When Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened up to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. When Jesus was talking to Nathanael, he made Nathanael a promise, John chapter 1 and verse 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you, Nathanael, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the sons of man. When Stephen is getting stoned, Stephen was the great preacher in the book of Acts. And they were, the Jews were stoning Stephen because they didn't like the message about the resurrected Christ. As Stephen was about to die in Acts chapter 7 and verse 56, Stephen, while he was being stoned, said, Look, I see heaven opened up and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
Sometimes, even more than just the heavens being opened up, we have a record of somebody that was actually transported into heaven. If you remember that that was Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. And I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but God knows. This man was caught up into paradise. The things that he heard were too sacred for words. The things that this man was not permitted to. To tell. So the things that Paul saw, he was not permitted to tell. But here we have another ecstatic vision of things in heaven, and John is going to be able to tell us exactly what he saw up there. Just as a side note, um, on this idea of heaven opening up, uh, we've already covered how revelation, in order to understand the revelation correctly, you've got to be able to pick up on all the nuances that take us back to the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures is what John was full of, and that's how he expressed the visions that he saw. Without that, people can make up all kinds of things that aren't necessarily true. One of the things here is that uh, there have been some claims that they say when John was taken up into heaven that that was the rapture of the church. I just wanted to give you a quick note, a commentator on Revelations, Ben Witherington Ben Witherington here talks about the rapture. He says, it is quite unwarranted to make out of this chapter a proof text for the rapture of the church. We're talking about a pre-tribulation rapture, if you've ever heard of that. If you haven't, you don't need to worry about it. But some are saying that before things get bad, before the, the tribulation, that the whole church is going to be raptured up to heaven so that nobody has to suffer. Uh, not a good exposition of the text. But anyway... Uh, quite unwarranted text for the rapture of the church. Since this text can be paralleled with other apocalyptic literature, it's already paralleled as we saw in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 22, a guy named Micaiah. A guy named Micaiah sees the same thing that John sees here. So it's unwarranted to impress the rapture of the church in that verse. Okay, so if we move on to verse 2, this is going to be item number 2, the throne and the one seated on the throne. The throne and the one seated on the throne. At once I was in the Spirit, verse 2. Behold, a throne was in heaven. Someone was seated on the throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Around the throne was a rainbow, and it had the appearance of an emerald. It's important to note here that in the Old Testament, God was pictured as kind of an old man. If you remember in Daniel, he was called the Ancient of Days, and it talked about his white hair and a white beard. John is very careful here to avoid any, uh, the fancy word, anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. Anthropos means man. He doesn't want to paint God in the picture or image of a man. He wants to use these spectacular ideas. And so he uses color. He uses precious gem stones. Later on, he's going to use thunder and lightning. All of these things to express the awesomeness of God. None of which express him looking like a man at all. Uh, we saw this in the Psalms. Uh, the psalmist in uh, Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O oh Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed in the splendor and the majesty, covering yourself in light as though it were a garment. And so that's the way John explains what he saw on the throne. Uh, number three, he talked about these three precious metals, jasper, carnelian, and emerald. Doesn't really mean anything to anybody, does it? So if we were to try to bring this into our own time, I think if we said something more like the bronze, the silver, and the gold, right away, doesn't that remind you of the Olympics? Okay? We have our own things that we're used to that right away remind us of something. If I was to talk about something that went gold, then it went platinum, then it went double platinum, how many of you thought of record sales? Right? That's how it works. So we have these images of precious materials that trigger things in our mind. The Olympics, album sales, uh, this, this particular array, these three stones, jasper, carnelian, emerald, they must have had the same effect on that first century church. 
Uh, let me just tell you briefly where we've seen these. Plato mentions these three stones together, representing the most precious of all stones. Uh, these three stones are noted in the wealth of the king of Tyre, Ezekiel chapter 28. Amongst the precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest, these three stones are in that breastplate, uh, Exodus chapter 28. And these three stones are also found in the foundation of the holy city in heaven. So there must have been something awesome, inspiring about these three. That'll be in Revelations 21. The 24 elders. The 24 elders are going to be the fourth cultic image I want to look at. And we'll look at verse 4 in Revelation. Around the throne, there were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their head. It's typical to talk about an emperor with the hosts that would surround him. And so what John sees is a parody of that same thing. I want to go back to uh, Micaiah. I told you I would tell you a story about Micaiah that looks a lot like John's. This is going to come from 1 Kings chapter 22, chapter 22 and verse 19. Uh, 1 Kings 22 is during the, the time of the evil king Ahab. Evil king Ahab, Ahab was the one that married the Phoenician prophetess Jezebel. She introduced Baal worship into Israel. Not a good couple. I think Ahab uh, goes down as the worst king in, in Jewish history. I better double check that. But he was a bad dude. So during his time, he wanted to ask of the prophets if he went to war with Syria, if he would attack Syria, would he win? And so he went to all of his own prophets and all of his own prophets told him what he wanted to hear. Oh, king, you're awesome. You're great. There's no one like you. Of course, if you go to war with these guys, of course you're going to win. But he had a feeling that that was just lip service. So he wanted to find a prophet of God that would tell him what was going to happen. And they choose Micaiah. Micaiah is the true prophet of God. And when he asks God about uh, Ahab going to war against uh, Syria, uh, Syrians, sorry, the Syrians, God tells them that he's going to lose. All right, but uh, here's this little part about Micaiah, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. 19. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all of the hosts of heaven were standing beside him on his right hand and on his left hand. So a vision very similar to what John is giving us. Uh, the story goes on to say that, uh, that um, God was angry with Ahab for being such a bad ruler. And anytime you have a bad leader, you have bad people. Anytime you have a corrupt king, you have corrupt vassals. And so Israel was corrupted as a result of Ahab. God wanted him dead. So it's interesting. These people that are, you should read this, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen 19 in that chapter. These... Um, Hosts of heaven that are standing around God's throne. God has a discussion with these hosts. And he says, who wants to go for me and go talk to uh, Ahab? And so one of these hosts, one of these people said, I'll go. And God says, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to tell him? So the heavenly host says, I'll go plant a spirit of deceit in Ahab. And I'll make him feel like Micaiah is lying. And that way he won't listen to the prophet Micaiah and he'll go to war. And that's exactly what he does. So this heavenly host that is surrounding God has come down and done work for God on earth. That's a fascinating story. Let me touch briefly. That's our background of the 24 elders. Um, if we go back to the rapture, those that think the church has been raptured to heaven already, what they suggest these 24 elders are is 12 members of the patriarchs and the 12 apostles. And between the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles, you got Old Testament people and New Testament people, and they say, that's the church that's been raptured in heaven. I hope I've just showed you that's not correct. Uh, the other possibility, 24 groups of priests and 24 groups of Levites. In the Old Testament, God had them arrange the priests and the Levites. The priest's job were to perform functions in the, in the temple, 
The Levites' job were to issue praise and worship and to be the musicians. Now, there's something there, the 24 uh, courses of priests and the 24 courses of Levites, because you remember when God told Moses to build everything exactly according to the plan, because you're building an image of what exists in heaven. So follow my plan exactly, because this is the earthly version of what's in heaven. So it could possibly be that these 24 courses of priests, 24 courses of Levites, represented these 24 elders that are up in heaven. That's a possibility. But let's just make sure, I would say 1 Kings 22, Micaiah, the Lord sitting on his throne with the heavenly hosts around him. That's the best interpretation of that. Also, there's a distinction made in the scripture between the 24 elders and the saints of the church. There's a distinction made between the two. <clears throat> in chapter 5 and verse 8, the elders hold the golden bowls that contain the prayers of the saints. Chapter 7 and verse 13, one of the elders has to go and explain the vision to John. Chapter 11 and verse 18, the elders go and thank God for the perseverance of the saints. The elders in verse uh, chapter 4 and chapter 11, the elders are all seated on thrones, whereas in chapter 7, the saints are all before God. And then the, uh, the one that's the most undeniable, chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, And the saints all got together to sing a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, and before the elders. So the elders, the saints, and the creatures are three distinct individuals. Number five, the progressive theophanies. That's the fancy word, theophanies. Theophany is when God speaks. And in our text, this is, uh, let's see, that comes to verse five. If you want to look at verse five with me. From the throne there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits, Thunder and lightning, hopefully that reminds you of Mount Sinai. And while Israel was in exile, God spoke from Mount Sinai, and there was thunder and fire and lightning and earthquakes. You remember Israel was so terrified of the scene that they said, Oh, Moses, don't have God talk to us anymore because we're scared to death when God talks to us. Why? Because God talks in theophanies. Lightnings, thunders, earthquakes, that's God's theophany. So don't have God talk to us anymore, Moses. You talk to us yourself. So here we see those from Mount Sinai. They're showing up here. Uh, what's going to be interesting is these are going to progress. These are going to progress. Uh, here in chapter 4 and verse 5, we have lightnings, rumblings, and thunders. In chapter 8 and verse 5, we've got lightnings, rumblings, thunders, and then he adds, and an earthquake. In chapter 11 and verse 19, lightnings, rumblings, thunders, and earthquake, and he adds hail. In chapter 16 and verse 18, lightnings, rumblings, thunders, a great earthquake, and a great amount of hail. So this is one of the things that Revelation does. These people must have been way more astute, they must have retained information better than we do because this book was being read and these people were following along the storyline. And this theophany here is a theophany that's building up towards the real the theophany throughout Revelation from, from chapter 4 through, verse, through chapter 16. These theophanies, when God speaks, they get greater and greater and greater. They're just kind of building anticipation where the reader is wondering what's going to happen at the end of these theophanies, what's going to happen when he gets to the final one, okay? That's the idea there. Uh, one commentator, uh, David Oon, said that uh, another aspect of this theophany, the thunderbolt, things that happened in the sky were always closely associated with the mythical Greek gods. In particular, the god Zeus had a thunderbolt as his sign of power. And the Roman counterpart was Jupiter. So consequently, these signs could be being used to suggest the divinity of emperors, and in particular, the, the divinity of Domitian, 
for those of you that haven't realized yet, I, I tend to go with the late date of Revelation, about 96 probably, which is about the time that Domitian died and another uh, emperor took over. But uh, Domitian had all these epiphanies to himself, these grandiose phrases about himself that he called himself uh, Lord and God, which only God could be called that. Uh, and he also embraced the idea of a thunderbolt as a sign of his power. The four cherubim, number six, the four cherubim. We'll go to verse uh, the second part of verse six there. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are the four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in the back. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third creature, the face of a man. The fourth creature, like an eagle in flight. Hopefully that should trigger something for you good Old Testament scholars. And if it doesn't, it's Ezekiel chapter 1. John is seeing the same vision that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. There's going to be two of these visions. John sees the same thing Ezekiel saw. John also sees the same thing that Isaiah saw. Let's do Ezekiel first, chapter 7. That's the allusion here. Ezekiel 1, I think we're around verse 4 or so. Uh, in the 13th year, in the oh no, I skipped around, I'm sorry. I skipped around, so this is probably verse 1. In the 13th year, the fourth month of the fifth day, I was among the exiles, the Shabar Canal, and the heavens were opened up. Here's another one of those apocalyptic rapture scenes. And I saw visions of God. Verse 5, and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. Verse 10, the likeness of their faces, each one had the face of a human, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. And finally, I'm jumping down. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. So the question is, why does John see one of the same, a similar thing? A similar thing is what Daniel saw. And I'm going to tie that together for you. Let's read verse 8 in Revelation. And this is an allusion to Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> verse 8 in Revelation. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings. They were full of eyes. They were all around and within. All day and all night they never ceased saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, is, and is to come. I'm going to read to you uh, the allusion to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. There it is. Isaiah 6 and 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He was high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each of them had six wings. Did you catch that? Each of them had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called to another and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So how do these allusions relate to Revelation? First of all, in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah gets the throne room of God, it's important to understand the background of that. Uh, Isaiah had only known Uzziah to be the king. Uzziah was a king that had reigned for 52 years. And he was a good king, so Israel was thriving. After 52 years, in the last year of Uzziah's reign, Uzziah decides he wants to go into the temple of God and he wants to offer incense the way the priests did. Does anybody remember that story? Uzziah wants to offer incense and the priest said, you can't do that because that's a priest's job, not a king's job. Well, being the king, he said, well, I get to do whatever I want. So he went to offer incense. And Do you remember? He was struck with leprosy. He had to go into exile and he died alone because he chose to disobey God after 52 years of having been faithful to him. So why does Isaiah get a throne room scene? Because after 52 years, uh, Israel has lost a good king. And Isaiah and Israel has got to be wondering what's going to happen next. And so Isaiah is given a throne room scene to give him confidence about what's coming. In Ezekiel's case, Ezekiel had been taken away 
in the Babylonian exile. Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. And Ezekiel is in exile. And Ezekiel gets a throne room scene. Why does Ezekiel get a throne room scene? Can you imagine the desperation and the hopelessness that Israel and uh, Dan and Ezekiel were feeling at this moment. They know Israel's been, uh, Jerusalem has been demolished. They know the temple has been demolished. Where is God going to be then if the temple has been demolished? Because in those days, God's presence was in the temple. So Israel is without hope in a foreign land. Ezekiel gets a throne room scene, gets a vision of God in all of his glory and splendor, and he is encouraged and given faith. Here's what's interesting about Ezekiel's story, if you want to read that one. Ezekiel gets a throne room scene, but in Ezekiel's scene, the throne room is on a chariot with four wheels. Why would Ezekiel get a, a throne room scene of a chariot being on wheels? And it's to show Ezekiel that God can go anywhere he wants to go. God is not stuck in the temple of Jerusalem. Why would he use a chariot? Well, because they didn't have Honda Accords back in that day, right? The chariot was to show Ezekiel that God can go anywhere he wants to go. Four wheels meant forward, backwards, left and right. And Ezekiel needed that vision. So now we come, why are all of these related to John and his vision? Because John has been stripped of all of his wealth. He's been found guilty in a court of law. He's been exiled to the island of Patmos to hard labor. And the churches in the province, the Roman province of Asia, are going to be persecuted because they cannot worship the emperor. And if you didn't worship the emperor of Rome, you died. You had your head cut off or you were crucified. They had the synagogue of the Jews that were persecuting them, kicking them out, no longer considering them Jews. Any believer of Christ was no longer allowed in the temple. So you've got this persecution. The church needed a message, and that's why they got this throne room scene. <clears throat> There's another scripture in this text that separates the saints from the 24 elders and from the four creatures. It's in Revelation 5 and 13. The saints, uh, I already gave you 14 in verse 3. The saints all sing a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and before the elders. Here's going to be the second reference in chapter 5 and verse 13 and 14. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth and all that is in them Say to him who is on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing, honor, glory, might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Three different groups of people. Number seven, casting crowns. What is the idea of casting crowns? What does that mean? Does anybody know? Let me see a hand if anybody knows what this is. There we go. Okay, great. Here we go. Verse nine of Revelation in verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever, the 24 elders fall down and worship before him who is seated on the throne. They worship him who lives forever and ever, and they all cast their thrones before the altar. Now, it's not a game of horseshoes. It's not a game of bocce ball. You might think that. But they're casting crowns that has a significance in the first century. And I gave you a copy here of uh, one of my books. This is a, a book on the Roman wars and the Roman history with Parthia. I'm particular interested, particularly interested with Rome's wars with the Parthians because that was Rome's eastern border as far as Judea. The other side of the Euphrates there was all the Parthians. And Rome was always fighting with them over who was controlling Judea, who was controlling Jerusalem. And was Rome pushing Parthians or were the Parthians moving in? And the other reason I'm fascinated with it is because this history takes place about 30 years before Christ and it lasts till about 120 years after Christ. So we're talking about the wars that Rome was having while Christ was alive. Particularly fasted with, fascinated with that information. Here, uh, Rome has allied with the Parthians in order to defeat the Armenians. And once they defeat the Armenians, there's no such thing as everybody going home and being okay with everything. When Rome defeated somebody, it humiliated you. Your king had to come bow down before 
the emperor or a statue, take off your crown and bow down and acknowledge that you had been defeated. Somebody else was more powerful than you. And that's where this text comes in here. In a formal ceremony, a formal ceremony, so people are gathered to witness this. Some days later, the Armenian monarch removed the crown from his head before the assembled Roman and Parthian troops, and it laid it at the feet of the statue of Nero that had been erected specifically for that purpose. This agreement was reached late in 63, uh, 63 AD. So this casting of crowns was happening already 30 years before John writes his apocalypse. <clears throat> It was not until 66 that it was consumed. I'm just particularly fascinated about that. We've actually got Roman history depicting somebody casting their crown before Rome. And so here, uh, the vision that John gets is that all of these heavenly hosts, even the most powerful of the heavenly hosts, when it comes time to worship the one on the throne, all the most powerful heavenly hosts have to bow face to the ground give up their crown to acknowledge who is the authority, who is the king, who is in power. And that's what these guys are doing by casting their crown. The last one, number eight, guys, the Greek drama, a Greek chorus. Let me read to you the, the little verse here. Verse 11 in Revelation. Worthy are you, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will... They existed and were created. This is the second song that gets sung to God. And I said that these are really the most important aspects of chapters 4 and 5. The vision that he gets, again, it's playing off of what was common in that first century, what was common amongst Rome and the Greeks. And when the Greeks would put on a, a drama, when the Greeks would put on a play, remember Nero wanted to be in these dramas and these plays, right? He was so impressed with the Greek drama. When the Greeks would have a drama, the guys would dance around and do their thing on stage, and then there would be a chorus off to the side that would sing a chorus to help the audience explain what they just saw. I went while I was in Arkansas at one time, and I saw Faust. Anybody see the opera Faust? Anybody know anything about it? Okay. Faust is this famous opera, uh, of a guy or a lady that sells their soul to Satan. But when you're watching it, you're seeing a guy dancing around and a girl dancing around and they're kind of chasing each other. Finally, one of them sits down and writes something on a piece of paper. And when you're in the audience, you're thinking to yourself, what in the world just happened? What are these people dancing around looking all goofy for? And then the opera starts. And when the singing starts, they start singing about what they did. The woman is singing her part. The guy that plays Satan is singing his. And it's the singing that explains the theatrical event that just happened. Well, the Greeks did it the same way. It was the singing that explained what you just saw. And so we make a mark that there are two songs uh, that are sung to the one on the throne in chapter 4. There's going to be three songs sung in chapter 5. We're going to look at that focus next week. But basically, uh, Craig Keener, an uh, authority on the book of Revelation, as a Greek chorus would explain the action of a Greek drama... So the heavenly songs in Revelation provide the true picture of the events of the book, the true picture of the one who is on the throne. So there we go. We just touched uh, briefly on the eight uh, cultic symbols, the open door in heaven, the throne, the precious stones, 24 elders, the progressive theophanies. The theophanies was the lightning and thunder the uh, four cherubim, the four creatures, the casting of crowns, and the song of praise, which is the Greek chorus. Hopefully with that little bit of background of each of those kind of fills in exactly how intense the worship is of the one who is on the throne in heaven. So that wraps up the cultic images. Next week, we'll look at Revelation 4 again, uh, but I want to focus on what really is the dominant center of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, the one who is on the throne, the one who is exalted. And it's an important image because on earth, there are a lot of other people that seem like they're the ones in charge. Nero seems like he's the one in charge. 
Later on, the beast that comes up out of the ocean seems like he's the one in charge. And as a matter of fact, lots of people do fall down and worship these other people on these other thrones. And the Christian church is shown the one who is truly on the throne, the throne that's in heaven, to remind the church, don't worship the ones that are down here on earth with you. Know that there is a throne in heaven and worship him the way the angels do. Really, this is going to bring about Jesus' prayer. The Our Father, when he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. What? As it is in heaven. We are going to get a glimpse of worship in heaven to help the church bring about the way God is worshipped so that God can be worshipped on earth just as he is being worshipped in heaven. And we're going to do that part next week. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that we have exposited the text correctly, that we have um, understood it a little bit better. And But Father, the, the bottom line of all of it is everything in heaven, everything on earth, everything under the earth, everything in the ocean, all bows down at your throne and worships you, Father. You are the king, you are omnipotent, the creator of all things. Our minds cannot even comprehend the vastness of your existence, Father, the way you spread out the galaxies, let alone spread out the earth, the earth as your footstool. Father, we're in awe of you. We love you, we thank you for your mercy in our life. In Christ's name we pray, amen.